Stop settling for being second best or the second option or the phone that answers at 2.30, right? Stop settling for less than what God created you for. Stop chasing after things that God's already rescued you from. Toxic cycles of relationships over and over. Oh, they're going to change. Oh, it's going to be different this time. Oh, they went to church last Sunday, so they must be changed. And you keep getting into these relationships, and the issues keep happening over and over. And then you're blaming God, saying, God, why are you doing this to me? And he's like, that's you, bro. You keep jumping back into it. I've rescued you once. I've rescued you twice. But you keep going back to the same thing. Last week was good. We were in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're in a series right now. We're going through the book of 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter. So today is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about relationship. We're going to talk about singleness. We're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of those things. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Now, those are all the people who are single. The, rela- the people who are in marriage, they're like, no, I'm really not that excited to talk about it. But before we do so, I was reaching out to a, a guy this morning, and he mentioned something to me that I, this, this was not a part of my sermon, but I wanted to share this with you all. Uh, he's recently come, to, come back to Jesus. He's been coming to church here recently. And in doing so, he made a comment. He said, man, things were pretty good, but since I've been following the Lord, things have been pretty tough, right? Things have been pretty tough. And I was like, ain't that the truth? Because does anybody have that testimony of, hey, I've started following the Lord. I started reading my Bible. I started praying. I started going back to church. And all of the sudden, it seems or feels like things are unraveling. It almost seems as if things are worse. I come to Jesus, and now things are getting a little bit more challenging. Things are getting a little bit harder. And I was reminded of a verse found in 1 Peter chapter 4. If you guys have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. This is not a part of my actual sermon. This was a word that I got this morning as I was texting with this guy. Because I think a lot of us are in that place where we start following the Lord, things go good, and then life happens. I want to remind you guys that following Jesus isn't a contingency plan, or following Jesus doesn't make you immune to the issues of life. It just gives you a hope to now hold on to as we go through them. Does that make sense? He is now our lifesaver. He is now our anchor. He is now our our, our firm foundation. He's a rock on which we can build our lives, because even the Bible says the wind will blow. The storm will come. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean now the storm and the rain and the wind stop blowing. But it gives us something to build on so that when it does, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, when it does, we're not shaken. And so in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says this, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. In the context of the scripture, Peter is talking to the church that is being persecuted. They're being persecuted like real fiery trials. Like they're being killed for their faith. Our fiery trials are like, I don't have enough Wi-Fi on my cell phone, right? Or I stubbed my toe. Or, man, I tried to get those new sneakers, but everybody bought them before they dropped. Like that's our first world problems. Those are the fiery trials that we have. Some of us will say, oh, you know, God, why have you given me your hardest battle? And he's like, you just have food poisoning. It's not that deep. You ate bad potato salad. It's not as serious as you think it is. But this fiery trial... That he's talking about, he's saying, don't think it's strange when life starts to get weird, when life starts to get hard, when things start to go south. Don't think it's strange. He goes on in the, in the, the next verse, he says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. When you become a Christian, you put a big target on your back. The enemy's not happy with you giving your life to the Lord. He had you right where he wanted you not saved, not covered by the blood, not filled with the Holy Spirit. You weren't a threat. But the moment that you put your faith in Jesus and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and start now living for him, you become a problem. And what does he want to do with that problem? He wants to take you and what you're going through, and he wants you to take your eyes off of Jesus and to place them on your circumstances. Because many of us, we look at our circumstances and we tell God about how big they are, but I want to ask you guys right now, What is the right thing to do? Should we be talking to God about how big our issues are or should we be telling our issues how big God is? He's a big God and doesn't promise that everything's gonna be easy or everything's just gonna go according to our plan. But he gives us a hope and an anchor to hold on to in the middle of the storm and whatever it is that we're going through. Amen? That's not even part of the sermon. Can we get to the sermon actually this morning? 
In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, it's basically him answering questions that were written to him. So the whole book of 1 Corinthians is a letter, right? I'm reminding you guys, quick recap. It's Pastor Paul writing to a church that he planted. And this church is messed up, man. They got some issues. Looks kind of like the church today. There's all kinds of immorality. There's some weird sex stuff going on. There's people not taking care of each other. They're fighting. They're suing each other. This is all in the Bible. We've gone through these first six chapters. And so they're asking him questions about marriage. They're asking him about singleness. He's asking them about uh, divorce. He's asking them about uh, uh, different kinds of things and, and what that looks like. And so this is what he's talking about in chapter 7, verse 1. He says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, he says this, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the action due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5 says, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment, for I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. That's saying a lot. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, what is he saying? Pastor Andrew. And some of the husbands are like, see, you're supposed to give it to me regularly, right? And he's, he's like nudging his wife. I'm like, thank God I brought her to church today. Like this is the day because it's been a while, right? It's been a little, it's, we've been in a dry and weary land. Thank you for laughing at that. But he says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, he's not sitting here saying that sex isn't good. Sex is great. Sex is something that God designed for man and woman to take part in. But what he's saying here is he's like, okay, let the husband render to his wife the affection due, and likewise the wife to the husband. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body. There's this idea that we were put together for a reason, and that is to keep us from sexual immorality. We are sexual creatures and natures, and that's just the way that we were created. And one of the issues here is he's like saying, hey, it's good for you to be in a marriage because of sexual immorality. It keeps you safe. It protects you. It gives you an outlet for all of that pent-up aggression and what you're going through. And if you don't have that, then sometimes it can get a little tricky. It can be challenging. He even says that you should not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you can give yourselves to fasting and prayer. It is good for a husband and a wife to come together and to be intimate with one another. But it's also good for them to take time apart from that so that they can fast and they can pray. So that that's not their focus, that that's not their God, that that's not what controls them. Amen? He goes on and says, um, but you should come back together again because of your lack of self-control. See, this isn't a popular message to talk about in church. Like, a lot of people don't want to talk about this. They don't want to talk about sex. They don't want to talk about relationship uh, unless it's three ways to, you know, X, Y, and Z. But he goes on and says in verse 8, he says, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, then let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. This is Paul's opinion. Paul's saying, hey, it's better to be single, and we'll get to why it's probably better. How many of you guys believe that, though? Who here is lonely and, like, looking for somebody? Don't raise your hand, okay? That's, that's thirsty. Don't do it, okay? Like, in your heart, you might be lonely, and you might be looking for somebody. Don't raise your hand when I say that. Um, that's not a good look. That's me, Pastor. I'm so alone, and I need somebody. That's why, because you get to pump the brakes. But the Lord wants us to be self-controlled. He wants us, in my opinion, and according to what Paul has to say, he wants us to exercise self-control. Celibacy is not a bad thing. In the church, marriage is celebrated, right? Right? Like, that's one of the heights that we're trying to raise people to. Oh, you got to get married, man. You're alone. You're by yourself. You should get married. Oh, you would be perfect with this person. And we almost look at people who are single or not in a relationship as if they are a pariah, a social pariah, or they're some kind of leper or outcast. Like, what's wrong with them? Why don't they have somebody? Gosh, you must be real tough to be around, right? 
So we start to look at people like this. But here, and we're going to get into a little bit, like get into it deeper, of why there's a benefit to being single. There's a benefit. In fact, he's sitting here saying, look, if you're not married, or if you were married and are no longer, he says, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. Paul remained single. And he goes on and says, uh, if they cannot exercise self-control, then let them marry. So all the married people, if you look at it through the eyes of Scripture, the people who are single and celibate and have self-control are almost like up here. And if you're mar- the married people are like, yo, I got to get married, bro. I'm burning with passion. Like, I have no self-control. I have this sexual urge and desire. I'm burning with passion. It's better for me to get into a relationship. What does that tell you? Somehow in Christianity, we've got it flipped upside down where we, we, we exalt relationship. We exalt marriage as if it's this final place. It's this final uh, the arrival point. But that's not what the word of God says. In verse 10, again, and this is a letter, right, to a church in Corinth. And in this city, this is a, a Roman Greco area, and I talked about this last week. This is a place where sexual immorality runs rampant, right? There, there, this is where the, excuse my language, if there's the orgy takes place in the Roman society. Sex is their God. They, they think that it's okay. Everybody's just having sex with everybody, and there's no self-control. And so he's speaking to this church that's been planted in the middle of this city that is filled with chaos. And he's trying to explain to them, hey, stop burning with passion. You should have some self-control. Marriage isn't necessarily better than being single. You guys need to run from temptation. Last verse or last chapter, he's talking about flee from sexual immorality. He's trying to give them some concessions. He's trying to give them some boundaries and some guidelines. He's trying to help them understand what it is that they're dealing with biblically through their cultural lens. Because you preach this in different cities and different places. It looks different. Context is everything. The city in which Corinth lies is a city that is overrun with immorality. So we, too, as readers of the word, when we read this, we apply it to our lives, but we also apply it to our lives through the context in which it was written. How many of you know that 1 Corinthians is a letter to a specific church dealing with a specific issue? So when we read some of these things, it's easy to take the scripture out of context. Men have have historically used some of the verses in this chapter to oppress and to manipulate and to demand sex. Well, the Bible says that you're my wife and you're supposed to give it to me when I want. Am I wrong? Historically, this has taken place. But when you put the scripture in the context in which it was written, it starts to look different. It starts to look the way that it's supposed to. In verse 10, he says, Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, right? A wife is not to depart from her husband. In this time, because they were new Christians, they were thinking that it was more spiritual to not be married. So people were getting saved in this church, in this city, and they were married, and the women were leaving their husbands, thinking, oh, well, I'm going to be celibate. I'm going to walk away from sex and immorality, and I'm not going to be married anymore. So when you read that, now it starts to make sense. He says, to the married, I command you, not me, but the Lord, a wife is not supposed to leave her husband. But then he says in verse 11, even if she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to that husband who she left. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. We take some of these scriptures and we make them these judgments on people's lives when we read them outside of the context in which they were written. Knowledge is power. Understanding what is said here is going to change and transform your life. When you start to read the scripture in the way in which it was written, it will change the way in which you engage and interact with the people in your lives. In verse 12, he says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. And so here he's saying, I've got an opinion on this. He's like, I say this, not the Lord. But to the rest, and that's to those who are unmarried, that's to those who, uh, or anybody else is listening. He says, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. And we'll, we'll take a second right there. Sometimes people get saved in a relationship, and their other partner's not saved. And one of the things that they want to do is what? They want to leave. They're like, oh, well, I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to church. I'm doing these things. My partner, 
they're not going to get saved. It's probably best for me to marry that cute drummer in the worship band or that guy on the guitar. Like, oh, man, the guy's serving coffee. He's just, you know, he's really filled with the Holy Spirit. He would probably be a better mate than my husband who's at home watching football on Sunday. But, but what the scripture's sitting here saying is, hey, if you come to the Lord and your partner is not a believer, it's better for you to stay with them. It's better for you to stay with them. Why? Because in doing so, you're sanctifying that individual, not saving them. Understand that. And we'll talk about this in a second. They're not saved because of your faith, but they're sanctified, meaning that they can stand under the same blessings and the same umbrella of love and grace and, uh, and, and, and comfort that God has over you. So if I'm saved and my wife isn't, the same blessing and covering that I have over me sanctifies her. Does that make sense? So what he's saying is don't leave them just because they're not believers. Now, let's talk about this. Are there reasons that people should leave marriages? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bible says, oh, only for sexual immorality. But then there's other instances when people are getting their butts kicked up and down the, the bedroom and up and down the living room. Do you think that they should stay in that relationship? So what we have done is we've taken scripture and we have made these judgments. Oh, you got to stick it out. You got to stay with it. You got to be a doormat. You got to get your butt handed to you because it's not sexual immorality. No, we have to also use common sense and we have to love people. So this isn't written as a judgment of like, husbands, don't divorce your wife. No, if she's cheating, leave. If you, if you guys are putting hands on each other, that's not safe. You should leave. There are issues and there are reasons why it is okay. And I'm sure our loving God will understand and forgive you. He says here in the rest of that verse, if you, the, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, otherwise your children would be unclean, and now they are holy. Verse 15 says, but if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So again, if I'm saved, my partner isn't. I'm not to be the one to initiate the split. I'm called to serve them and love them and to be there for them. If they don't want to be with me because I'm a Christian, guess what? It's deuces. They can go. That's what the Bible says. It's, it's fine. Some of you guys clap. <laughs> let me just hold my tongue. Uh, but if the unbeliever departs, let him depart, because now you're no longer in bondage. So even in, in, in issues like this, there is instruction and there's guidance. Why? In verse 16, he says, how do you know a wife whether you will save your husband, or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? At the end of the day, you have to use discernment, and you have to be very careful. There's, the situations aren't black and white. You have to do your due diligence. You have to do your research. You have to look at every situation uh, through the lens of the Lord and through the scope of love. So when somebody comes to me and they're like, Pastor Andrew, I'm struggling in my marriage, and I'm thinking about leaving my partner, there's some things I got to know. All right? Are, 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 they being, are, is, are they unfaithful? Okay? No. All right. Um, well, are, are they putting their hands on you? No? Okay. Well, well, what's the issue? Oh, he's leaving the toilet seat up. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about maybe getting some counseling, right? There's some things that aren't worthy to just leave your partner. Oh, well, they're not a believer. Okay, well, does he want to stay with you? Yeah, he does want to stay. Well, the Bible it, it encourages us to stay to, because not only do you sanctify them, but your faith might just save them. It might just save them. And so when we read this scripture, when we read this word, we have to understand that the context in which it was written to the audience during the time, during the culture, and, and what it was trying to do here, right? I don't know if, do you, guys, do you guys read the Bible in its original context, or do you just take the scripture as it just comes up on your daily Bible verse, right? You got to do a better job of understanding it. Philippians 4.13, who knows that verse? Somebody want to yell it out? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right? That's not a verse just for you to get through that last set of your bench press. Do you guys understand that? It's not just a cool little necklace or just a cool little scripture to put in your bio. Do you understand the context in which it was written? We're talking about Christians under extreme persecution, being killed and martyred for their faith. Not just to get through that last set or to get through that last 30 minutes of cardio, right? Because God can help you get through those things as well. But at the end of the day, we're taking scripture to fit our narrative and our biases. And what happens is that when it doesn't fit in with what we want, we try to change the Bible and we don't let the Bible change us. 
But and it won't change you unless you start to read it in the way in which it was written. So yes, this is another sermon about why you should be reading your Bible, why you should be studying this word. We're going to jump over to verse 25. Because verse 17 through 24 really talks about living as you're called or, or being content with the situation in which God called you. So if God called me as single, then he wants me to be content as single. If I'm married and God calls me to be married, then he wants me to be content as a married person. And so that's where he's kind of doubling down. Paul's doubling down of like, hey, live as you are called. Stop seeking the other side. Because what do we many times do is we think that the grass is greener on the other side. When you're single, you're like, oh, man, I just want to be in a relationship. And then I have somebody to cuddle with. And, man, it's about to be summertime. And then I got someone to go to the beach with and hold hands with. And then in the winter, it's not that cold. And then, you know, you, you start thinking that. And then you get in a relationship. You're like, I just need some space. I just want to breathe. I can't do anything. And then married people are like, man, I just want to be single, man. I can just go out and do whatever I want to do. And I can just go wherever I want to go. But then when you're single, you're like, man, I've missed my wife, and I just, I wish I had somebody who would laugh at my jokes because nobody else does, and it's like, be content as you are. And that doesn't mean that you have to stay as you are, but there's this idea of acceptance. Accept where God called you at in the place that you're at. And if it's a part of his plan, purpose, and will, he'll change that. He'll change that. So if you come to the Lord and you're single, stop making seeking a relationship, your God or your idol. He'll put you in a relationship where the time is right. My single people, give it up. Hey, they're like, I'm, I claim that. Verse 25. And yeah, we're walking through this whole chapter. We're almost there. He says, now concerning virgins. Now, I know not all of you guys just closed your ears. You're just like, ah, not talking about me. Um, I want to explain to you what this means in context. Because for some of you, the ship has sailed. Virgins re- re- refer to young, unmarried men and women. Many times these people are betrothed or they're engaged to somebody. So when he's talking about virgins, it's not somebody who hasn't necessarily done the deed. They're, they're, they're talking about young, married, unmarried people who are single. So this is actually for the single or the young people who might be engaged or might be betrothed. So he says, I have no commandment from the Lord, but I got a lot to say. He says, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. So Paul's like, God didn't give this to me. This is me giving this to you because... I've been through some things. He says, I suppose that therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, before you guys get excited, let me explain to you. The present distress in the moment when he's writing this, they're going through persecution. There was also a famine taking place. So when he's writing this, he's saying, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. So it's best for you if you were to remain as you are. He says, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. In the time that he writes this, there's a lot of stuff going on. He's basically saying, hey, don't try to get married. Don't try to change your status. Because if you're married, then you got to run back and get your kids and everybody. But if you're single, right, then you're able to just grab your stuff and go. So he's saying, don't change your status. Don't go to Facebook and change your relationship status. Keep it as it is because there's a lot of stuff going on. Your focus shouldn't be on whether you have somebody or you don't. It should be on him. So many of us in, these, in this day and age, we have made relationship an idol. More people are more concerned about serving their spouse than serving our Lord. They're more concerned about finding somebody, finding their godly person, than they are than with serving him. And you know what's funny is I believe that if more people served God, they'd find their godly spouse. I, I really do. I really do. Because a lot of the times people are looking in all the wrong places. Right? You think that you're going to find your godly spouse at the bar or at the, the latest mixer or the latest rooftop? You think that that's who, the latest person who served you a bottle service? Like that's where you think that you're going to find your person? And that's no knock. If any of you guys do bottle service, I apologize. I, I love you. And, and hey, you got to hustle. LA, you got to have two jobs out here, maybe three. Like, I get it. All right. I'm not trying to shame you. All I'm saying is, where are you fishing? Where are you looking? Where are you putting your bait out? I bet many of you would find what it is that you're looking for if you would look in the right place. The man or woman of God that you're searching for is probably serving God. They're probably on the front lines preaching the gospel or feeding the homeless or doing something in the community. They're most likely not where the places that you're looking. 
He goes on to say in verse 29, he says, I say this, time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. And that doesn't mean you can start acting single, gentlemen, okay? Those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. He's basically saying, hey, time is short. Let's keep our eyes on eternity. The world is passing away. Too many, of you, too many of us are focused on things that do not concern the capital K kingdom. All right, how many of us come to God for a blessing? How many of us come to God or our prayer life only comes alive when we need something? God, I need you. I need you to move. I need you to open a door. I need you to heal this. I need you to fix this. I need you to provide this. But how many of us just want to go and sit at his feet because he's good? How many of us look at God and we determine his character or his nature based on our circumstances? So when things are good, oh, God's so good. Oh, how are you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. I got that tax return. That money came in. Everything's good. My bills are paid. Oh, you know what? God's so good. But when that tax return didn't hit for a couple extra days, right, when, when things aren't going good, when the gas runs out, when you're running around on faith and fumes, well, God doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. He's forgot about me. Oh, my God, is he even there? Like, oh, your faith is determined based on your circumstances. And so here he's saying, listen, stop basing the nature and the character of who God is based on how your day's going. We got to do a better job of knowing who he is regardless of what it is that we're going through. In verse 32, he goes on to say, here are some of the pros of singleness. He says, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the world, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin, again, the unmarried. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. He's saying when you're single, you can care about the things of the Lord, but when you're married, you got to care about your wife and your kids. You are more able to do the things that God's calling you to do when you don't have any obligations or responsibilities. Does that make sense? Are you guys tracking with me? If God were to say to me today, Andrew, I need you to pack everything up and I need you to move to Pakistan and become a missionary. I'd be like, well, let me run it by my wife first. Journey, are you up to it? Well, I got kids in another state that I need to talk to. I don't know. I've got a lot of cares. I've got a lot of worries. I've got a lot of things. So what does that do? That renders me less accessible and available and able to do those things. Some of you, what I just described, you're like, yo, that sounds great. When do we go? Because you've got no wife. You've got no kids. You've got no responsibility. And so for, for, for us, we tend to exalt marriage, but marriage handcuffs a lot of us. And it's not bad. It's not a bad thing. I love my wife and my kids, and I love the stability and the comfort and not being alone. I get that. But what he's saying here in this last verse, he says, uh, I say this for your own profit. Again, not to forbid you, not to stop you, but to put this into an eternal perspective. He says, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Too many of us have made our lives about serving ourselves and not him. You were not saved for yourself. You were saved to serve him. You were saved because you're his. You were bought for a price. And too many of us want to live our lives as if God's just here to answer our every beck and call. He's not a genie. We don't rub the Bible and ask God for what it is that we want. And that's what the, the, the kind of relationship that we want, is we want that relationship where we just ask God to give us what we want, to do this, to do these things. That's not God. That's a genie. We got to do a better job. In verse 36, he goes on to say, uh, and he talks about this. He says, but if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, let me explain this, okay? This is a father. He's saying, hey, if any of you fathers think that you're misbehaving improperly towards your unmarried daughters if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. So he's talking to a dad. Hey, I'm talking about being celibate. I'm talking about being single. I'm talking about not giving your daughters away. I'm talking about it's better for you to remain unmarried. He's talking to the father. He's saying, hey, whether you send your daughter off to get married or you, uh, you keep her at home, it's up to you. 
And the reason why is because at the time when this was written, many times the, the father was the one who was responsible for the arrangement of marriage. Does that make sense? So when you read this at first glance, you're like, if a man is in, uh, behaving improperly toward a virgin, uh, then it's not talking about that. It's talking about a father who is sending off his daughter to marriage. In verse 38, so then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. Again, Paul's a little biased. He thinks that being single is superior to being married. And he has a pretty good case. In verse 39, closing this down, talks about widows. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Basically, she can't just marry anybody. She's got to marry another believer. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. When we're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 7 or 8 or whatever chapter we're going through, I know that it can be hard, right? But the idea here is breaking down context. It would be easy for me to get up here and preach topical sermons. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I felt the conviction to actually teach the Bible. What does the Bible say? I feel like we have too many pastors who get up and it's all about them. It's all about their, their, their uh, different props. It's about the smoke. It's about the biggest and, and, and best thing that they can do. Too many pastors don't just get up here and preach the word of God anymore. They don't just read it. And so that's my personal conviction. This might not be the church for you because I'm going to get up here and I'm not going to just teach topics that tickle your ears. I'm not going to just give you a motiv motivational speech. They got TED Talks for that. I'm here as a pastor to lead you in the word. And so we're going to break down 1 Corinthians chapter 8 next week. We're going to talk about it. And so I get that it can sometimes be hard to hold on to this because you might not be single, you might not be married, you might not have a daughter. Like, it might not apply. But I disagree. I disagree. Because we're talking about relationships in general. We're talking about God in general. We're talking about the order in which he wants us to do these things. There's order in everything. And a lot of your guys' lives are out of order because you have no order. A lot of you guys are out of order because you don't know what the word of God says about the subjects that you're questioning. Whether it's finances, whether it's health, whether it's prayer, whether it's relationship, this covers it all. This talks about all of it. And I want to create an environment where we come in here and we talk about the hard things. I wasn't super excited about preaching about this. I really wasn't. Trying to explain what a virgin was and I had to say, you know, I know there's kids in the audience and I'm like trying to break this down. There's going to be some weird conversations on the way home. People are like, mom and dad, what's an orgy? And you're going to be like, oh my God. Pastor did say that, but in the context of what was taking place in the Greco-Rome, like let them know what it is um, and, and help them to understand the wickedness and depravity of the world that we live in. But um, the overarching message today and what you can take home from this is contentment. It's honestly contentment. Whether you're single, you're married, you're widowed, I feel like the whole message of this is, hey, be content with where you're at and stop wanting what you don't already have. Honestly, that's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I read here. Single, married, divorced, widowed. Stop wanting what other people have. If God wants that for you in your life, if that's what he created you for, then he'll bring it. Stop striving after it. Stop chasing after it. A lot of people are chasing after something that no, the other person doesn't even want. Stop settling for being second best or the second option or the phone that answers at 2.30. Right? Stop settling for less than what God created you for. Stop chasing after things that God's already rescued you from. Toxic cycles of relationships over and over. Oh, they're going to change. Oh, it's going to be different this time. Oh, they went to church last Sunday, so they must be changed. And you keep getting into these relationships, and the issues keep happening over and over. And then you're blaming God, saying, God, wh why are you doing this to me? And he's like, that's you, bro. You keep jumping back into it. I've rescued you once. I've rescued you twice. But you keep going back to the same thing. The Bible says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a sinner returns to its sin. And a lot of us are in that place when it comes to relationship because we're not content with where God has called us to be in this moment, in this season, and at this assignment in life. Paul says, be content where God has placed you. Because your marital status does not define your value, your worth, or your identity. It doesn't, whether you're single or you're married. I want you to remember that these guidelines that I went over when it comes to divorce and being widowed or betrothing to other people relationship, they're guidelines. And they're not meant to be burdensome. 
They're not meant to have you stop and not be able to move forward, but they're supposed to give you some direction. They're supposed to help you. In fact, they're meant to free us from distraction. They're meant to help us focus on what really matters, and that's eternity. At the end of the day, that's eternity. The Bible said that life is short, right? Life is short. It's short. We don't know when he's coming back. And so we got to keep first things first. And he's got to be first. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says what? Seek me first in all my righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. He's got to be first. Be content with, you're at, with where you're at. Put him first and watch all the other stuff connect the dots. Our relationship with God uh, is a reflection of our relationship with others. Or let, me, let me say that in a different way. The quality of our relationships that we have with others is directly correlated with our relationship with God. So if we have good communication and we uh, spend time with the Lord and we learn about him, we read about him, if, the, if that's a good relationship, then that flows into our other earthly relationships. My relationship with my wife is good because my relationship with God is good. And so if you're having issues in your relationships, in your marriages, if you're single and you're having a hard time making it stick, make sure that your relationship with him is first and that it's in order. And when that's in order, everything else falls in line. <laughs> Worship, you guys might as well come up. Our ultimate fulfillment comes not from our earthly relationships, but from our relationship with Jesus. But do you guys see it that way? Do you guys truly believe that? Like, it's easy to say that that's what we believe. Oh, I believe that. I, I, I believe that with my mouth, but our actions say otherwise. Do you guys see your salvation and your relationship with Jesus as the greatest gift that you could ever receive? Do you see that? Like, that is the greatest gift that you will ever receive. It was given to you free. It was free. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to share a few more scriptures. I promise we're landing this plane. We're ending this bad boy. But Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, for those of you who have your Bible, it tells a story about treasure. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Again, in verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Too many of our relationships with God is a, a this and that, is we're not selling ourselves out for God. We're not going all in. We're inviting God into our mess and into our circumstances, but we're not laying it all down at the altar. We're inviting him to change our stuff, but we're not allowing him to actually change us. We've got to do a better job. The, the pearl of great price. Are you willing to let it all go? Are you willing to sell it all? Are you willing to put everything that you have into one basket and that basket being Jesus? Too many of us are holding on to our lives of the world, the things that we had in this world, and we're trying to drag it with us into our relationship with Christ, and it's not going to work. I've shared a dream that I had a few months ago at one of our services, and, and it was this prophetic vision of going through TSA, right? God's calling me through the gate. He's saying, come on, you got pre-check, let's go. You got to skip the line, let's go. We're taking off. And as I'm trying to get through the security gate, I'm not able to because I'm holding on to baggage and things that aren't allowed to come with me. And he's saying, if you want to come to where I'm calling you, you have got to let go of the past. You've got to let go of who you were. You've got to let go of the baggage. And I wasn't able to go through until I let go of what it was that I was holding on to and step into the newness of what God called me to. And I think that that's a lot of us here in this place in 2024. We're holding on to who we were. We want Jesus and. We've got one foot in the world, one foot in the word, and we're lukewarm. I'm calling believers to step up and to stand up and to get hungry about the word, to get passionate about serving him. To start looking at your salvation as for what it is. It is the greatest gift that you will ever receive. There's nothing greater. Thank you for watching. When you tithe, donate, and contribute, you're partnering with Royal City Church in preaching the gospel around the world. So thank you. 
Before you go, make sure you turn on the notifications and hit that subscribe button. And do me a favor, share this with at least one person. You never know who might need an uplifting message. If nobody's told you today, let me be the first. I love you and God does too.